So, well, what's graph deep learning? Well, you could say this is a graph, right? We know that from math that we can plot graphs, but this is not what we're going to talk about today. Also, you could say a graph is like a plot like this one, but these are also not the plots that we want to talk about today. So, is it Steffi graph? No, we are also not talking about Steffi Graf. So what we actually want to look at are more things like this, like diagrams that can be connected with different nodes and edges. So a computer scientist thinks of a graph as a set of nodes and they are connected through edges. So this is the kind of graphs that we want to talk about today. For a mathematician, a graph is a manifold, but a discrete one. So now how would you define a convolution on Euclidean space? Well, both for computer scientists and mathematicians, this is too easy. So this is the discrete convolution, which is essentially just a sum. And we remember we had many of those discrete convolutions when we were setting up the kernels for our convolutional deep models. In the continuous form, it actually takes the following form. So it's essentially an integral that is computed over the entire space. And I brought an example here. So if you want to convolve two Gaussian curves, then you essentially move them over each other, multiply at each point and sum them up. And of course, a convolution of two Gaussians is a Gaussian again. So this is also easy. So how would you define a convolution on graphs now? The computer scientist thinks really hard, but what the heck? Well, the mathematician knows that we can use Laplace transforms in order to describe convolutions. And therefore we look into the Laplacian that is here given as the divergence of the gradients. So in math, we can deal with these things more easily. And that was my 1987 diploma thesis, which was all about that. So this then brings us to this manifold idea. We know how to convolve manifolds. We can discretize convolutions. And this means that we know how to convolve graphs. So let's diffuse some heat. So we know that we can describe Newton's law of cooling as the following equation. So we know that the development over time can be described with the Laplacian. So f of xt is then the amount of heat at point x at time t. Then you need to have an initial heat distribution. So you need to know how the heat is in the zero state. And then you can use the Laplacian in order to express how the system behaves over time. And here you can see that this is essentially the difference between f of x and the average of f on an infinitesimal small sphere around x. Now, how do we express the Laplacian in discrete form? Well, that's the difference between f of x and the average of f on an infinitesimal sphere around x. So the smallest step that we can do is actually connect the current node with its neighbors. So we can express the Laplacian as a weighted sum over the edge weights Aij. And this is then the difference of our center node Fi minus Fj. And we divide the whole thing by the number of connections that actually are incoming into Fi. So this is going to be given as Di. Now, is there another way of expressing this? Well, yes. And we can do this if you look at an example graph here. So we have the nodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And we can now compute the Laplacian matrix using the matrix D. And D is now simply the number of incoming connections into the respective nodes. So we can see that node 1 has two incoming connections. Node 2 has 3, node 3 has 2, node 4 has 3, and node 5 also has 3, node 6 has only one incoming connection. 
And what we else need is the matrix A and that's the adjacency matrix. So here we have a one for every node that is connected with a different node and you can see it can be expressed with the following matrix. Now we can take the two and compute the Laplacian as D minus A. So we simply element wise subtract the two to get our Laplacian matrix. This is nice. So we can see that the Laplacian is an n times n matrix and it's describing a graph or subgraph consisting of n nodes. D is also an n times n matrix and it's called the degree matrix and describes the number of edges connected to each node. A is also an n times n matrix and it's the adjacency matrix that describes the connectivity of the graph. So for a directed graph, our graph Laplacian matrix is not symmetric positive definite. So we need to normalize it in order to get a symmetric version. And this can be done in the following way. So we start with the original Laplacian matrix and we know that D is simply a diagonal matrix. So we can compute the inverse square root and multiply it from the left hand side and the right hand side. Then we can plug in the original definition and you see that we can rearrange this a little bit and we can then write the symmetrized version as the unity matrix minus D and here we apply again element wise the inverse and the square root times A times the same matrix. So this is very interesting, right? So we can always get the symmetrized version of this matrix even for directed graphs. And now we are interested in how to use this actually. So we can do some magic. And the magic now is if our matrix is symmetric positive definite, then the matrix can be decomposed into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And here we see that all the eigenvectors are assembled in U and the eigenvalues are on this diagonal matrix lambda. Now these eigenvectors are known as the graph Fourier modes and the eigenvalues are known as the spectral frequencies. This means that we can use U and U transpose in order to Fourier transform a graph and our lambdas are the spectral filter coefficients. So we can transform a graph into a spectral representation and look at its spectral properties. So let's continue with our matrix and now let X be some signal, a scalar for every node. Then we can use the Laplacian's eigenvectors to define its Fourier transform. And this then is simply X hat and X hat can be expressed as U transpose times X. Of course, we can also invert this and this is simply done by applying u. So we can also find for any set of coefficients that are describing properties of the nodes the respective spectral representation. Now we can also describe a convolution with a filter in spectral domain. So we express the convolution using a Fourier representation and therefore we bring g and x into Fourier domain, multiply the two and compute the inverse Fourier transform. So we know that from signal processing that we can also do this in traditional signals. Now let's construct a filter and this filter is composed by a kth order polynomial of Laplacians with coefficients theta i and they are simply real numbers. So we can now find this kind of polynomial that is a polynomial with respect to the spectral coefficients and it's linear in the coefficients theta. And this is essentially just a sum over the polynomials. So now we can use that and use this filter in order to perform our convolution. So we essentially have to multiply in the same way as we did before. So we have the signal, we do the Fourier transform, then we apply our convolution using our polynomial and then we do the inverse Fourier transform. So this would be how we would apply this filter to a new signal. Now what? Well, we can convolve X now 
using the Laplacian as we adapt our filter coefficients theta. But u is actually really heavy. Remember, we can't use the trick of a fast Fourier transform here. So it's always a full matrix multiplication. And this might be very heavy to compute if you want to express your convolutions in this type of format. But what if I told you a clever choice of polynomials cancels out u entirely? Well, so if we choose k equals to 1, theta 0 to 2 theta and theta 1 to minus theta, we get the following polynomial. So we still have the configuration that we have x transformed into Fourier space times our polynomial expressed as matrix times the inverse Fourier transform here. Now let's look into the configuration of g hat. g hat can actually be expressed as 2 times theta times lambda to the power of 0. Remember, lambda is a diagonal matrix, so we take every element to the power of 0. So this is actually a unity matrix. And we subtract theta times lambda to the power of 1. Well, this is actually just lambda. And then we can express our complete matrix G hat in this way. Of course, we can then pull in our u from the left hand side and the right hand side, which is giving us the following expression. Now we use the property that theta is actually a scalar, so we can pull it to the front. The lambda to the power of zero cancels out because this is essentially just an identity matrix. And the lambda on the right hand side term still remains, but we can also pull out the theta. Well, the u, u transpose just cancels out. So this is again the identity matrix. And we can use our definition of the symmetric version of our graph Laplacian. And you can see that we've just find it here in our equation. So we can also replace it with this one. And you see now u is suddenly gone. So we can pull out theta again and all that remains is that we have two times the identity matrix minus the symmetric version of the graph Laplacian. If we now plug in the definition of the symmetric version associated to the original adjacency matrix and the degree matrix, we can see that we still can plug this definition in. Then one of the identity matrices cancels out and we finally get identity plus d to the power of minus 0.5 times a times d to the power of minus 0.5. So remember d is a diagonal matrix, so we can easily invert the elements on the diagonal and we can also take element-wise the square root. So this is perfectly fine. So this way we don't have u at all coming up here and we can express our entire graph convolution in this very nice way using the graph Laplacian matrix. Now let's analyze this term a little more. So we can see this identity on the left hand side. We see we can convolve x in spectral domain and we can construct g hat as a polynomial of Laplacian filters. Then we can see with a particular choice k equals 1 and theta 0 equals to 2 theta and theta 1 equals to minus theta, then this term suddenly only depends on the scalar value theta. And with all these tricks, we got rid of the Fourier transform u transpose. Huh? So we suddenly can express graph convolutions in this simplified way. Well, this is the basic graph convolution operation and you can find this actually shown in reference number one. You can essentially do this with a scalar value. You use your degree matrix and plug it in here. You use your adjacency matrix and you plug it in here. And then you can optimize with respect to theta in order to find the weight for your convolutions. Well, now the question is, is it really necessary to motivate the graph convolution from spectral domain? And the answer is no. So we can also motivate it spatially as well.
So let's look at the following concept. For a mathematician, a graph is a manifold but a discrete one. We can discretize the manifold and do spectral convolution using the Laplacian matrix. So this led us to spectral graph convolutions. But as computer scientists, you can interpret a graph as a set of nodes and vertices connected through edges. And we now need to define how to aggregate the information of one vertex through its neighbors. And if we do so, we get spatial graph convolution. Well, how is this done? One approach shown in reference two is graph sage. And here we essentially define a vertex of interest and we define how neighbors contribute to the vertex of interest. So technically we implement this using a feature vector at the node V in the kth layer. And this can be described as H K V. So for the zero of layer, this contains the input. So this is just the original configuration of your graph. And then we need to be able to aggregate in order to compute the next layer. And this is done by using a special aggregation function over the previous layer. And therefore you use all of the neighbors. And typically you define this neighborhood such that every node that is connected to the node under consideration is included in this neighborhood. So this then brings us to the graph sage algorithm. So here you start with a graph and input features and then you do the following algorithm. So you initialize at H0 with simply the input of the graph configuration and then you iterate over the layers and you iterate over the nodes. For every node you run the aggregation function that somehow computes a summary over all of your neighbors. Then the result is a vector of a certain dimension and you then take the aggregated vector and the current configuration of the vector, you concatenate them and multiply them with a weight matrix. And this is then run through a nonlinearity. Lastly, you then still scale by the magnitude of your activations. And this is then iterated over all of the layers. And finally, you get the output Z that is the result of your graph convolution. So the concept of aggregators is key to develop this algorithm because in every node you may have a different number of neighbors. So a very simple aggregator would then be simply computing the mean. Of course, you can also take the GCN aggregator and this then brings us back to the spectral representation and the connection between spatial and spectral can be established. You can take a pooling aggregator, which then uses, for example, maximum pooling, or you use recurrent networks like an LSTM aggregator. And you already see that there's broad variety of aggregators. And this is then also the reason why there's so many different graph deep learning approaches. But you can subdivide them into certain kinds because there is spectral ones, there is spatial ones, and there are the recurrent ones. So this is essentially the key how you can tackle the graph convolutional neural networks. So what do we actually want to do? Well, you can then take one of these algorithms and apply it to some mesh. And of course, this can also be done on very complex meshes. And I will put a couple of references that you can see what kind of applications can be done. For example, you can use it in order to process information on coronary arteries. Of course, I also have a couple of references. And if you have some time, please read through them. They elaborate much more closely the ideas that we presented here. And there's also image references that I'll put into the description of this video. So thank you very much for listening and see you. Bye bye.